um, Global Issue Oral Recording. So I'm going to try to do an example for you with some books that um, one of which you you're reading and one of which you may not have read. Um, so I chose two books. One book is this book. It's called On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Um, and it's by a guy called Ocean Vuong. He's um, Vietnamese American and his mother um, immigrated from Vietnam, had a really difficult time. She survived the Vietnam War and, um, you know, a lot of violence. And um, so he writes this book and he's also um, coming out as gay, um, which is one of the themes in this novel, but that's not really what I'm focusing on. Um, it's a really good book if you want to read it. It's pretty graphic and raw, but um, beautiful, beautiful writing. Um, so I'm going to write about a, a passage that talks about the word sorry um, and how it's used as like a way to permit your own existence as um, an immigrant. He says, you know, the first phrase of this is says, the most common English word spoken in the nail salon was sorry. His mother worked in a nail salon. So um, sort of this idea that he's presenting that immigrants are sort of apologizing for their existence um, in order to have permission, right, to just be, which I thought was a really interesting concept, um, you know, the way that he perceived it. And I'm comparing it to a passage in Americana, um, and and this may be a bit of a stretch, but I'm comparing it to the way that Kofi, um, or Cozy, sorry, the way that Kosi, who is Obinte's wife, sort of makes herself very accommodating to be accepted into the society in which she lives, into this sort of like higher level society. Um, and one of the quotes on page 34 that really spoke to me was um, that Cozy led the way around the room, blah, 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 basking in the attention her face drew, but flattening her personality so that her beauty did not threaten. Um, and that it says, wholesomely agreeable person to have no sharp angles sticking out. So sort of making herself smaller to be acceptable to other people. So I'm comparing those two passages um, in those two novels. And then um, I'm going to look at how I will compare those two things and then how I will sort of continue on to write those two things. So you want to start with you know, two different passages that are between zero and 40 lines, um, and those should be pretty meaty. So quickly here, I'm just adding the titles of the text and the global issue that I've been thinking about. Maybe I'll think of something better to call this, but for now, that's like the kind of thing that I might want for a title. So... Obviously, this won't go here if I'm actually starting a paper. I think probably it will go here. I'm going to write my name here. I'm going to write um, IB Literature. Or if you want to be fancy, you write Language A Literature. And you spell it right if you want to be really fancy. And then you put your teacher's name here. And you put the date. So this is due on May 17th. Okay. Um, and then you write uh, Namera. And then you insert page number. And that's MLA formatting. And for the purposes of MLA formatting, you want to make sure that you are writing in Times New Roman or Arial. So I think we might do that, right? That looks nice. Okay. Global issue, the shrinking of the powerless, how powerless people make themselves small to accommodate the powerful. Eh, it's a little repetitive, but let's go with it. So as I write this paper, I want to write an introduction. So my introduction, and I'm going to, I'll probably come back and delete these, 
but I want to start with like sort of a outline. So, um, and because I wrote these already, I'm just going to go ahead and put them here. Um, I'll just say in both Ocean Wong's On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous and Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. The authors describe a common human trait of shrinking oneself to suit a more to be non-threatening to a powerful figure supporting the power structure. Maybe I'll say the status quo power structure. Okay. But what am I missing here? I think what I'm missing here is what are these authors doing? So what are they doing to... What are authors doing with language to show this global issue, right? Am I just imagining it? Or are they doing things? So I'm going to go through and I'm going to choose a color I like better, like not for that, for this. So as soon as they, so here's the passage from Americana. As soon as they arrived at the chief's party, Cozy led the way around the, the room, hugging men and women she barely knew, which I'm not sure what that indicates, but I'm highlighting it, calling the over ones Ma and Sir with exaggerated respect. And I think what's very interesting is the exaggerated respect. And so I'm going to start a list here of things that I think are important. Not that. I wonder if it'll let me just copy and paste this. So copy and paste. Okay. So exaggerated respect is something I think is significant. Um, Flattening her personality so that her beauty did not threaten. Um, I don't know why I separated those. I think they're somewhat similar. Um, she praised a woman's hair, another's dress, a man's tie. So she praises sort of... Trained X, Y, Z, almost systematically, and I'm going to write that here so I don't forget. Like, there's a formula to this. She said, we thank God often. And in this case, I think she's kind of feigning uh, humility, kind of. So it's, eh, it's not very significant, but there's a sense that she's not trying to make herself self-important, or she's not trying to describe herself that when a woman asked her in an accusing tone, what cream? And here it is in an accusing tone. So this is sort of how she's received. Because she has like a higher level of beauty than anyone in the room, people are accusing her of something. What cream do you use on your face? How can one person have that kind of perfect skin? Cosi laughed graciously and promised to send a woman a text message with details of her skincare routine. Obinze had always been struck by how important it was to her to be a wholesomely agreeable person and to have no sharp angles sticking out. I think that's really important. Um, she says suitably overfed. I think that's significant, right? Overfed being the important word here. She
has to be kind of over conciliatory. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but she kind of can't just be the value that she is, right? Uncle, you must eat. Oh, there's more meat in the kitchen. Let me bring you another kitchen. Guinness. The first time he took her to his mother's house in Suka, just before they got married, she left up to help with the serving. Left up. There's something about left up. There's like an overzealousness with that. Overzealousness. Um, she got up offended and said, Mommy, how can I be here and you will be cleaning? She ended every sense since she spoke to uncles. I think that's important. She ended every sentence to uncles with sir. It's almost like the thank you thing. She put ribbons in the hair of his cousin's daughter. There was something immodest about her modesty. It announced itself. Now that's interesting, and I don't know that that's similar. I think there's a little bit difference there between that and something else that you might see. So this is this is a difference. And in this difference, that may be where I would make that distinction. And I might use this in the conclusion because it's different, and you'll see this from Wong's sorry um, idea. Okay, you'll see it. So here we have Ocean Wong, um, and it's not spelled with an X because it's that's not. So. Um, the most common English word spoken in the nail salon was sorry. And I think here what's really important is that he uses the word, and I'll start a new one for this. The most common English, sorry, English word, uh, meaning that there are other English words being spoken. I mean, non-English words. Um, and it gives a sense of um, inauthenticity. Um, because obviously the workers are probably speaking in, in this case, it's probably Vietnamese because they're Vietnamese. Sorry, it was, there you go, I'm sorry. It was, a, women do this too with the sorry thing, girls. It was one refrain for, for what it meant to work in the service of beauty. Again and again, I watched as manicurists bowed over hand or foot. I think this is significant because bowing is like the most significant way to humble yourself in front of another person. Some young as seven say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry, when they had done nothing wrong. This is like extensive... And in fact, that pattern, which is very interesting, um, um, is almost like the complimenting that, what's her name does, that uh, this gal, Kosi does. It's like, you say it once, twice, three times. She says, uh, compliments X, Y, and Z. A man's hair, I mean a woman's hair, a man's tie another stress okay when they had done nothing wrong i've seen workers you included he's talking to his mom here i've seen workers you included apologize dozens of times throughout a 45 minute manicure hoping to gain warm traction that would lead to the ultimate goal a tip only to say sorry when none was given i don't know why that's important yet but i will figure it out um in the nail salon sorry is a tool one uses to pander until the word itself becomes currency. So there's a sense that the number of times you, you know, currency is money. So the number of times you use, you know, this apology word, the more you get paid, basically. And it's presumably, presumably, because you are elevating the powerful in this situation and and making you feel powerful right um so it becomes currency it no longer merely apologizes but insists reminds 
I'm here, right here, beneath you. I mean, this really says it all, right? And that might be, this could be my hook, right? Because it says it all. It says it all, right? It says my thesis, in essence. It is the lowering of oneself so that the client feels right, superior, and charitable. And hey, I might even add that to my it says it all. Um, in the nail salon, one's definition of sorry is deranged, which is an interesting word. I'm going to highlight that because that is, that's a good one. Deranged into a new world where it once is charged and reused as both power and defacement at once. Being sorry pays. Being sorry even, or especially when, when one has no fault is worth every self-deprecating syllable that one's mouth allows because the mouth must eat goodness gracious girls this is really this is like gold it's like literary gold this guy you should read this book it's a bit much but you would like it i guess anyway this says it all um so i've got all these notes now and i think i gotta look at again i still haven't answered this question what is the author doing what are these authors doing with language to show, I mean, I see repetition, right? Wholesomely agreeable. This is like language of humility, right? So there's a, there's a humility there. There's this humility, conciliatory zealousness. I'm writing down these words, just humility, conciliatory, zealousness. There's repetition. There's immodest about her modesty. Interesting. It announced itself, and maybe this isn't actually different than Zong's idea. There's something important here. It announced itself. And in this one, it says, being sorry pays. One that's reused as both power and defacement. So in fact, being apologetic insists, reminds. So that's interesting too. Insists and reminds. It and it reminds the power that they're pa the powerful that they're powerful. And the payment, in some ways, like for Cosi, the payment is to be well liked and to fit into the society. And and for Wong he's talking about sort of the payment like you get tips um, and that's where your power comes in because you're basically those people are paying the powerful people are paying for you to remind and insist them insist to them that they are powerful therefore they're going to fulfill that position right they're going to give you something because they are powerful hmm interesting All right, so he uses repetition, um, language of insistence and, I would just say insistence, I guess. And then is there a sense that Like that being accommodating is like a currency unto itself. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. 
And so this causes me to rethink my thesis here. In both Ocean Vuong's On Earth, Very Briefly Gorgeous, and Americana by Chimumira Adichie, the, these authors describe a common human trait of shrinking oneself. Of, maybe this is it, of feigning Maybe of ritually feigning humility a common human experience of the powerless ritually feigning, meaning pretending humility. The powerless using the currency of humility, and we'll just let go of that because that's a bit much. Using the currency of humility to and I want to say raise us, I want to say let's see of the powerless using the currency of humility to elevate the powerless for personal gain. I don't know if that makes sense. Let's try. In both Ocean Vuong's On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous and Americana by Chimamanda and Gothi Aditi, these powerful, these authors describe a common experience of the powerless to use and maybe we just do this describe the currency of humility as a maybe it's like Humility as a currency to elevate the powerless, to elevate the powerful as a currency for the powerless, to elevate the powerful. I'm going to stop there. Okay, so they do that, and I don't know how much different that is from the original one, but you guys can see how hard it is. Both Ocean Vuong's On Earth We Are Brief Briefly Gorgeous and Americana by Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie. These authors describe humility as a currency for the powerless to elevate the powerful, which kind of gets at it. But I want to also talk about how do these authors use language to show that um, through the use of the language of humility conciliatory. I don't know what the Like, what is, it's not really a word. Is it? That seems wrong. Well, they say it is. Seems wrong. Seems really wrong. Hmm. I don't like that word. I'll probably change it. Nation? Is that a word? I don't know. So the use of the language of humility. 
I'm just going to say of zealous humility. Zealous humility. Of insistence. And... Repetition. These authors play on the subordination of the powerless as a strength, as maybe as a leverage, as leverage for. I'm just going to say as leverage. Okay. So that's okay. It's not great, but it is what it is. So, and I found my hook before, so I'm going to go back to here. And what you do realize is that what you do realize is that when you go in and you really um, 